every time I come, you meet me, you meet me. Oh, you're all we want. You're all we want. Hallelujah. How many people know that tonight is going to be a night of breakthrough? Tonight's going to be a night of power. But I want to tell you something right now. You don't have to wait to the end of the night for the altar call. You can come to the altar right now. You can shake it off. You can come down here right now. God has a touch for you right now in worship. Yes, God can touch you in your seat. But let me tell you something. When you come up here and you take a step of faith and you lose all your dignity and you lose everything, and you come with reckless abandonment and you don't care what you look like, you don't care that your wife's here, you don't care that your husband you're here, you're saying, hey, I'm going to the front because God has something different for me tonight. If that's you tonight, man, get down at this altar right now and don't wait for the end, man. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and he's the end. Now is the time. Don't miss your moment. God wants to touch you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on. Just like in the upper room, just like in the upper room, just like in the upper room. We wait, we wait for you. Just like in the upper room, just like in the upper room, just like in the upper room. Fears change, 
and overflow in this place. Fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surrounds us. like a river wash over me immerse me in water as deep as the sea hide me in love your healing embrace peace like a river Wash over me as I worship your majesty.
Sin revival.
to the outcry of the land. God, we will go for you. We will be a revival. Forgive us for not requiring you as our vital necessity. God, you're all we want. Jesus, you're all we need. You're all we want. bless the Lord with this this song right now and I, I, I hear me very clearly when I say that every victory is the aftermath of a fresh glimpse of Jesus every victory is the aftermath of a fresh glimpse of Jesus that when we're singing about revival a clearer view of Jesus is instant revival. There's no way you can see Jesus and be the same. There's no way you can see those eyes of fire pierce into your heart and see and be the same. It's just impossible. You, you're, if, if, if you're not sure if where you, it's like there's no way you can come into contact with the presence of God and just leave and be like, man, I just want to make double. You know, I'm just like, you know, it's like, no, you're just like, something took place in my heart. Something changed me forever. And tonight is our night to experience Him afresh. Like, you didn't just walk in here to just support somebody or even just say, you know, let's just check it out. No, you're here tonight because the eyes of Jesus are waiting for you to lie eyes with him so your life can be completely changed from the inside out tonight things that you just thought were part of your personality that you thought you could never shake freedom tonight in the name of Jesus depression anxiety that you haven't been able to shake tonight freedom because Jesus doesn't just give freedom he is freedom when you experience him you experience heaven on earth amen he is we're not waiting to get to heaven his presence, His presence is heaven alone. Oh, let's sing this to Him. Glorify Him. Lift your hands. Bless the Lord tonight. Bless the Lord. Shout this out. Worthy. Worthy. Bless the King. Jesus.
Just lift it up. want to share two things right before we move in it. Or for, I, when Caitlin came up here, as soon as she hit her knees, it was just like a lightning bolt went off in me. And I, I want you to hear why that's so perfect. It's not just somebody just being expressive in a moment. You know what happened is it, as soon as she hit her knees, it reminded me of the woman with the alabaster jar that it, it wasn't she had to say anything. She didn't have, it, everything she said was beautiful, but it was, as soon as she hit her knees, it was just like, it was just like you can tell what the Lord has in store, what he's speaking to individuals that you don't understand that uh, an expression of worship in a moment, it can break somebody free of something. It can, it can just do something to a room that, that words cannot, the way that you sing, the way that you shout, the way that you dance, it blesses the Lord. Just when my little girl, my little four-year-old girl, when she dances, she does, she's never took dance lessons a day in her life, but when she dances, it blesses me. When she sings, it doesn't matter if she's on tune or not, it's my little girl. When she sings, it blesses me. When she shouts, it bothers. No, it's, 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 it's still a blessing. Just, you know, I once, uh, um, a dear friend of mine and a mentor in my life, he told me one time that, you know, he was on the phone with somebody and all of his children were, were, were being really loud while he was on the phone crying and whining. Has any parent been there before? <laughs> He'd been on the phone and, that, and all the children are crying and the individual he was talking to over the phone, he, he begins to apologize that he's like, I'm so sorry that my kids are crying and whining. Why? He's like, don't you ever apologize. He said, and he said that one of his kids passed away and he didn't ever, and he said, don't ever apologize. You know, we forget. We, and I, the reason I bring that up is because sometimes your mind is already thinking about tomorrow, thinking about some problems. And what you need to tell your problems is, excuse me, problems, I got a God to praise. <laughs> Excuse, excuse, excuse me, problems. I got a God to praise. Because when I start praising him, guess what? The problems dissolve. They dissolve. Because God can't put his hand on it until you take your hands off of it. You got to let it go. You got to surrender it tonight in Jesus' name. Woo! You guys good? Well, if you may... If you want to find, if you're laid out on the floor, stay there. It's totally fine. But if you want to find a seat, if you can, we're going to worship our faces off some more. We're going to get doing, when we transition around here, it's not, we're staying in the flow of everything. I, how many were with us last night? Wasn't it so beautiful? It was so, so beautiful. How many are believing tonight's double portion night? And then tomorrow we're going even, we're going extra, extra till, you know, it's going to be triple portion tomorrow night. We got Minister Michael Dow coming tomorrow night. I tell you what, you got to be here. You cancel every plan you have. You just be here tomorrow night. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be fun. Sorry, bro. I'm going to like, <laughs> can we give it up for the worship team? Just love. Love immerse worship being with us and. Evan does so much. Oh, Evan, we love you, man. You're always rocking out, bro. Charles and Josh back on. I want to share a very brief word with you. If you could turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. All you have to do is open your Bible, turn a page. It should be pretty right after the table of contents. Genesis. I shared this with everyone yesterday, and I want this to be the thread throughout the whole week. The Lord spoke to my heart Friday and said, 
that there is a window right now. Does everybody understand that the Lord's return, whether it's tomorrow, 50 years, it, 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 it's, we are the closest we've ever been. When people said, do you believe Jesus is coming back? I believe we're a day closer than we were before. Right? That's always a true statement. We're getting closer. But I, with 2020, everything that's here, we have to understand that we've been given a window right now. And especially in Florida, we're very blessed to be in Florida, be able to preach the gospel the way we do. And I know the ministers here tonight are going to be able to tell you even what persecution looks like on foreign soil. And we're so blessed. And we have a window right now. And the Lord spoke to my heart Friday, and he said, I'm about to send a wave of prosperity to the body of Christ to fund the end time harvest. How many people received that? I, I heard this in my heart. And then the Lord started, people in our body started calling me and sharing with me testimonies of how the Lord's blessing them in their workplace, businesses, getting ex extraordinary deals that are supernatural. And the blessing of the Lord is the supernatural provision to turn imagination into manifestation. Okay? The blessing of the Lord is the supernatural provision to turn imagination into manifestation. That's what's happening. I want to share one brief thing with you tonight as we sow into the kingdom of God. We here at Gold Street Garden, I'm being transparent, we are believing for our own facilities, right? And, and, our, and our vision is we want to actually create facilities to be able to aid human traffic victims and get them to hear the gospel and raise them up and think. Like we, we, we are dreaming big. And in fact, last night, if you were here, if you stayed till 10, 30, or 11, <laughs> oh, I hadn't shared with Minister Scott who was here, and he began to speak vision that I had not shared with ever, anyone. And the Holy Spirit was confirming every little detail of where we're going. And I'm just wanting you to know, you want to be with a crazy bunch of people that love Jesus in this hour. Don't get around comfortable Christians. Don't get around people that are okay with, worth, with normal. No. We want supernatural. We want, we got to prepare ourselves to be there. And w that's why this conference is bringing the body of Christ together to go after the Great Commission with everything. That's what this is all about. Compassion, compassion is heaven's desire to restore your created value. You can't stand to see a drug addict. You can't stand to see somebody that's not living in their created value. That's what compassion is. Jesus was moved with compassion to heal, moved with compassion to raise the dead. It was amazing. He, do you know Jesus wrecks funerals? If you want a nice funeral, don't invite Jesus. He's going to wreck it, and then he'll, you'll thank him later. But what we have in Genesis chapter 2, starting in vi verse 15, it says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in a garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Men in this room, hear me. And this goes for women as well. I want, but I want you to hear, men, that when God create, created you, he has a place for you, but that place is not for you to sit around and eat Doritos and wait for checks from the government. You okay? You okay? A stimulus check is not a blessing from the Lord. You hear me? I hope I'm okay. I'm just... The Lord will show you what a true stimulus blessing is. He'll show you. I, I, I want a stimulus check from heaven. Yeah, you know, yes. But what I'm saying here is when God creates you, he has a place for you, but it says that he gives you a responsibility. Everyone say responsibility. He gives you an identity, and then he gives you a responsibility. It's not vice versa. You don't find your identity in your responsibility. You find your identity in him, and then you start working from your identity, not finding your identity from responsibility. You hearing me there? So identity is found. He places the man in the garden to do what? To tend it and to keep it. So, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat it, for in the day that you eat it you shall surely die. Pretty simple, right? Eat anything you want except this one thing. This is how God works in your life. He wants you to be, he wants you to be creative. Eat, partake of whatever you want. Just don't do business with the enemy. 
okay? So you keep reading. Verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. <laughs> Every man say amen to that, right? You know, because you know what's coming. You know what's coming. Whoa, man. All right. So, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him, which is actually showcasing and foreshadowing the Holy Spirit. Because who's the Holy Spirit? Our helper. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. This is why I want to show you how many people in here have a business. Okay, we did this. You're going to raise your hand again in, a, in another minute because we're going to pray for you. But, and how many people have a, a ministry? And I'm talking, like, so you see, we have some ministry. So you see, what happens is God, he told Adam to do what with all the things he created? These animals would walk by. Did God name the animals or who, who named the animals? Okay. So what, what God does is he creates because we don't create anything. There's nothing new under the sun. He just delegates. Everybody say creation is delegation. When God created something, he delegated it. He doesn't wake up every day and be like, hey, son, you got to shine. No, he created the son. He, he created what was in him, and then he delegated it, and it just stays. So when the animals came before Adam, what was Adam's responsibility? It was to name the animals. Guess what? You have a business and a ministry. What was, your, what was my job? That God gave me a vision, and I said, Gold Street Garden. Are you following me? You immerse the nations. You see somebody has a vision, your business name. God gave you an idea, and then you named it. And what God needs from you is he, he creates things and he places them in you. I heard Lou Engel say this. How many know Lou Engel? You know what Lou Engel says? He said that God had a dream and he wrapped your body around it and you find out what that dream is through prayer. Isn't that beautiful? And, and so we see that Adam gave names, but he, he did not find a helper comparable. But the biggest thing is that God then created a woman, created a helpmate because we need each other right? We need to teamwork. We need to come together. John 17, we were talking about this today, unity in the body of Christ. So everybody, what we're going to do right now, if we could pass out the offering envelopes, we want to sow into all the ministries that are a part of this conference. And I, I'm telling you that right now, we, we're going to bless every business in this house because you are about to see supernatural breakthrough. Even if you don't own a business, guess what? You're getting promoted. Guess what? Things are about to happen because God is bringing a wave of prosperity to the body of Christ for the end time harvest. Amen. People are going to hear visions, and it's only going to take one check from people in this, this house. People are going after it. Come on. Somebody say amen to this. Everything is shifting. Everything is shifting. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. As the offering envelopes are being passed out, I want to let everybody know. Everyone say May 4th. Eric Gilmore is going to be with us. Do you see that we are so excited to have Eric Gilmore with us May 4th? If you don't know who Eric Gilmore is, you're welcome. That's all I'll say. You're welcome. You just found out about him, and you can go check him out. But uh, I wanted to give that announcement, but if we put the giving back up, text GSG to 727-351-6160, and then we also have Cash App, Gold Street Garden, Venmo, Gold Street Garden. And I know Nick brought it up at the beginning. Can we make sure Immerse the Nations, all their... Their, their booth is over there with all bunch of evangelism shirts when you're out. Let's bless them tonight. Let's uh, buy everything at the table back there because that's what we need to do. We need to bless the body of Christ so that way people can keep winning more and more souls and beautifying the bride of Jesus. So just giving everyone a moment. Once again, you have to be here tomorrow night. I don't care what you have to do tomorrow night. Michael Dow is going to drop a, I mean, and I know Javin and Joe Turnbull even vouch. They, they, they know that Michael Dow, there's just, there's going to be a Holy Ghost bomb that's just going to fall. And it's going to happen tonight too, but I'm just letting you know. It's just, it's just, we're in for it. We're in for it. Hallelujah. A holy reckoning, yes. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. 
Does anybody need any more time? You can just say, you good? What I want to do is I'm going to pray over the offering, but everybody that has a business right now, raise your hand again, okay? Everybody see the hands up? We did this last night. I just, anybody that's near them, just stretch your hand or put a hand on them. And right now we're going to pray. And I'm going to pray for promotion for everyone else as well, but I want you to begin to pray. Father, we just thank you in the precious name of Jesus that the blessing of Abraham, the blessing of the Lord is be upon these businesses, Lord, that we are about to see supernatural increase, Lord, for the harvest, for the great commission, Lord. Father, I thank you that the wealth of the wicked has been laid up for the righteous, Lord. You, the psalmist said that I have been young and old and I have never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging for bread. Lord, we thank you that the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and out of no sorrow. We know, Lord, that you are bringing such a great, great and mighty harvest to the body of Christ. Lord, we thank you that these businesses are not only going to bring an increase, but these businesses are actually going to turn into revival hubs and all the employees at these businesses are going to be born again set on fire lord i thank you that people and clients that come in get just immersed in the power of god we thank you we thank you for all that you're doing in jesus mighty precious name the church yells amen hallelujah at this time we have offering baskets to the left and the right, and I just encourage you right now, we like for people to bring the offering to the altar. So you walk it down, we have it to the left and to the right. If you didn't give digitally, we just like to make so at this time, feel free to come forward. people know that healing is here tonight too I want you to know be you see when you come you got to come with expectation but the greatest expectation you can have is him it's just simply him when he's the reward you're right where you need to be so without further ado I want to I want to give such honor tonight do you know you know we are so blessed. You're so blessed in this room for what's about to take place tonight. We're about to see unity in such a beautiful way where there's, there's no limelight, there's nothing like that with any, any, that's why we're all teaming up. That's why we're all coming together. That's why the body of Christ is stronger when we are together, amen. And the enemy's main goal is division and divisiveness and to get us assuming that everybody thinks the worst. Who cares if they think the worst about you? You know what you do? You pray for them. Jesus picked Judas to be his disciple. All right? It's a whole sermon. What I want to do right now is the two gentlemen and, and their beautiful wives. I want you to, you know, we have to give honor to the whole family and all that goes on. I want to first off, Javin and Caitlin, they're a wonderful family, immerse the nations. When I first met Javin, we were down in Clearwater, and Justin and Bonnie, we had come lead worship one night, and Javin's just helping with anything he can. Caitlin, you could just see their hearts, and you know, Justin even said, you know, you should really, you should really talk to Javin a little bit more, and I had no clue that they had traveled the world preached in areas that nobody's ever preached the gospel never once would he mention it to me he's just helping with whatever it's not like he told me anything about who he was and he's just helping with anything that needs to get done 
and they've, they've traveled the world, preached the gospel to places that nobody's ever heard of. And then we started talking more and more, and I realized he goes out on the streets every week compelling churches to get out and go knock on doors, to go do outreaches, to go love. And the Lord called them from overseas to come back and deal with a bunch of spoiled brat Americans. <laughs> you know what? And this is what, and just such a heart. And I want you to know we're so honored to have you all. And Caitlin, we honor you. We honor Javin. And my dear friend, Joe Turnbull and Krista, you know, Joe and I go so far back now. What is it we were talking last night? What was it? Seven, eight years now. And when I first met Joe, I was like, I don't even know if this is going to work. <laughs> it's like, he came to one of our services when I was doing college and career, and he just got fresh off the streets, like just living for the devil big time. <laughs> and like he came to one of our services, and I was just like, Lord, why did you send this guy to me? I was like, I don't, know, I don't know if I can do this. But you know what? Joe changed my life. And, you know, people that are here that remember ATM days and things like that, like when Joe came, I have so many stories of us hitting the streets together and just learning, having no clue what we were doing other than loving Jesus and how the Lord has promoted Joe to be working with CFAN now, to be doing massive crusades and getting ready to go. He just got back from Pakistan. And I would, if you would have asked me that seven years ago, I would have been like, whoa. I would be, it would have been, but look at what the Lord has done. And I want you all to know that you are about to receive so much wealth tonight. And I want you to bring, just come with honor. Come and say, I just want to hear how I want to hear your steps of obedience. I want to hear what the Lord's placed on your heart tonight. So what we're going to do tonight is Javin's going to kick us off and minister. And then Joe's going to come up as well. And then we're going to have a very powerful altar service, okay? So right now, without further ado, can we give a standing ovation and love on Javin as he comes forward right now? God brought me into 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> and he starts 2 Corinthians like this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Not just most comfort, not some comfort, but the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Think about this for a moment. The God of all comfort has comforted us so that we can, in turn, comfort the world around us, but not with the comfort that we just simply understand with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. Not just to the capacity of our understanding, but the God of all comfort wants you to have an encounter so that we can be an encounter. And it's not just about comfort. When you've experienced his love, You've experienced something that this world does not have to offer. It's something that's divine. It's heavenly. It goes beyond our understanding. And the only way that we are truly going to show it to the world around us is if we first experience it. And I'm going to be honest, even just in worship, as we're worshiping here tonight, you guys feel it. There's something in this room, and I just need to take a moment, even before we introduce ourselves and, and go into all this, we just need to take a moment and just, can I just say the king is here? The king is here. The God of all comfort, the king is here. 
And he has something to offer each and every one of us that my words don't have the ability to transfer to you. And so, Father, we seek you right now. God of it all, I am yours. And we ask you, God, to do what only you can do here. We remove every expectation because I believe even our own expectation is a governor to the capacity of our creativity of what you want to do here. But I believe, Lord God, you want us to come into this place of surrender to you. Saying, God, whatever you want to do, do it in me. Do it in this place. Do it in this city. Do it in our nation. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And I, first off, I just want to say thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity for being here. It's been an honor getting to know you, knowing you. It's, you know, I look at a lot of your posts online. We were talking about this, and, and I, I see we're going out on the same weekends. You guys are going out, and I'm going, it's like we're doing on the same event here, just in different places, and just your heart for the Lord. You know, it's, we, we, like Pastor said, we've had the opportunity to, to travel. And as a team and as a, as a ministry, we've collectively been to close to 30 different nations around the world. And most of those places are places that most people don't want to go. They're in the unreached areas. They're in the neglected areas. They're in the restricted areas. And recently, God called our team back home. And I just want to say it's, it's an honor to, to know you as a person. And I'm looking forward to the partnership that I believe the Lord has, has put into place, man. Praise God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, that's honestly, that, that is the cry. I know we, we even talked about, we handed out those shirts today. These shirts that even what we're wearing, this is not just merch shirts to just help support what we do as a ministry, but this is also a sign unto ourselves that our heart and our goal is to immerse the nations in the power of Jesus. But it first has to start with me. First has to start with us. Starts with us as individuals having that encounter so that we can be an encounter. And I believe that even in this room tonight that there are city changers represented here. Yes. But it first starts with us. It starts with us having an encounter with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And when we do, it changes everything. It changes the way we think, it changes the way we talk, it changes the way we go about our lives. Literally everything begins to be transformed. As we begin to lock eyes with the Savior, he begins to transform our lens to viewing things differently. And it starts with actually viewing ourselves. And when we begin to recognize, like it says in John, that we are no longer, those of us who believe are no longer born of flesh and blood, but now you are born of God. That our inheritance is not just here on this earth, but our Father is in heaven. And he died so that we can live. And if we would recognize that right now, it would change everything. And it's that drive that has driven us around the world. We spent five years in Africa reaching what I say, never reached villages, villages that have never heard the name of Jesus. You know, we've had witch doctors try to poison us. We've been threatened. We've been in nations where bombs are exploding in our city. We've had knives pulled on us. You know, we've been through a lot of crazy things in our life. But I can tell you that through the miracles and the signs and wonders that we have seen on the field, both abroad and stateside, that that's not why I serve the Lord this, morning, this evening. I serve the Lord because I've tasted and seen that he is good. Yeah. And he's real. And he's alive and he's waiting to explode through us. And so we are immersed in the nations and God has led us around the world, but recently God has, has led us back home. And you know, just... 
you know, we've had the honor, you know, the worship team that was here is, is a part of our team. We travel often to different places across the U.S., and uh, we were traveling around overseas. And I remember even just a time, I mean, you, you felt the presence of the Lord as they were in worship. You know, I've been with these guys as we've been in nations where we have to worship in silence and worry that our, our neighbors might hear what's going on inside the house that we're worshiping in. And just to be with this worship team, because they're not just talented people. They're ones who are surrendered. They're surrendered to the Father. And I can tell you that when we're surrendered to the Father, He begins to work things in our hearts and we feel it as they begin to worship. It's not just the talent, but God begins to move in our lives. I remember being overseas with them at one point in the Middle East and you know, we, were, we, we ended up climbing over this mountain overlooking the city. And, and God actually gave me a name. And we were in a city, and I, and, and I actually I was, pers- I was with a, a, another individual that we were walking with. And we went into this, this city, and we said, well, you know, let's just go and let's pray for people. But you have to be careful when you're in cities like this because you pray with the w- one wrong person. And you end up like some of my friends have been, and you get thrown in prison. And so we said, all right, let's, let's just allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. And we did, and, I, and actually, I asked the person next to me, I said, what is the first name that came into your head? I felt like the Holy Spirit was having me ask him that. And he said, Mustafa. And he was, a, he was someone that was a, a local there, and it was a normal name there, Mustafa. And I said, all right, well, let's begin to pray for Mustafa. Mustafa. And we began to walk through the city, and then God said, walk into this business. It was the first business that we walked into, and we walked into the business, and God said, told, it felt like the Lord was telling me, ask the, owner, ask the, 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 the clerk, where's Mustafa? And I said, well, okay. <laughs> we walked into this, this business, and I said, is Mustafa here? And the guy goes, yeah, he's sitting right over here. And there's a guy sitting down drinking tea, and he says, how do you know my name? And he invites us to have tea with him. Turns out he's the owner of the shop. And we begin to share with him the word of the Lord of how we heard his name and that God called us into the city just to speak to him. And that there's times when we live this life of surrender, I want to tell you that we've been in places where I don't want to go, that I don't have this compulsion to go into dangerous places and, 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 and just do crazy things, but there's something that we've surrendered to that is worth everything. And when we surrender to that, he begins to use us in ways that we will never imagine. If I was to write down on a piece of paper 10 years ago of how I believe and I can, the capacity of, of, of my mind of thinking how God wants to use us and use me in my life, and I wrote that down, I promise you it looks nothing like the life that I'm living currently <laughs> and have lived. Because when we surrender, he doesn't just take our plans and make them better. He transforms our plans to being something completely different, and we find ourselves going, God, what am I doing right now? And he says, surrender. Surrender to me. It was actually in the same place. I watched as we were about to baptize someone who was just converted, and, and, and they, he, he, we, we thought we were going to go to this beach, and he, we thought he was just going to be baptized and secretly, and we were going to come back off the water and, and you know, shake his hand, congratulations. And when we get to the spot, it was heavily um, uh, populated in this area. And we show up there, and they all showed up with guitars and instruments and tambourines. I'm like, man, this is, this is, this is going to be intense. <laughs> and I watched as this man walks out into the water, and he gets baptized, and he turns around looking at the community that he had just come from. And I thought this was going to be a secretive thing, but he turns around and looks at the community who can reject him, can stone him, can throw him in prison. And he began to preach the gospel to his brothers and his sisters. And my heart was transformed in that moment. Because I began to wonder and think about the moment I said yes to Jesus. Did I have that risk? What did I have to sacrifice when I said yes to Jesus? And to be honest, in comparison, it was very little. And then I began to wonder if, if we don't know the cost of Jesus, then can we truly know the value of who he is? And I think that's one of the struggles that we have in a Western world is, is it's hard to comprehend the, the value of of Jesus and everything that he represents if it's, if it's hard to comprehend the cost because the cost that we have here is very little. And it's a challenge that we are encouraging the body of Christ across every community across America right now to challenge within themselves because he is worth everything. 
He's worth everything. <laughs> to look at the state of America right now, 80% of our churches are on a decline. 95% of believers have never won a soul. Those of us filled with the Holy Spirit, Christians going to church, this is actually for church goers, 95% have never won a soul. 98% of the body of Christ, 98% believe it's our duty to evangelize the gospel, but only 2% are participants in the ministry of evangelism. Every day, every 90 seconds, someone dies having not known the gospel. God has called us for such a time as this. That God, when he was looking at time and space itself in creation, saw it fit that you would be alive in this hour. Think about that. He said, when he was looking over time and space, this is where I want David to be alive. This is where I want Abraham to be alive. This is where I want Moses to lead my people out of Egypt. And when we look at the times that we're living in currently, what we see, can we think about this for a moment? God has chosen you to be alive in this hour. In this crazy hour in 2020 when our whole nation was shut down. The whole world was in a shutdown. People were questioning so many different things. And God saw it fit that you would be alive in this hour. That you'd be here in this room, in this moment. And that there is something available for each and every one of us to capture that will change everything. And we feel like the Lord has actually brought our team off the mission field onto another mission field. And that's here in the States and what God is actually doing in our own community. He said, actually, we've been focusing on our own county. And we've been uniting churches across our, 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 our county. There's, there's roughly about 200,000 uh, uh, in population in Hernando County. And there's roughly about 40,000 Christians. And so what we've begun to realize is that if every Christian in Hernando County was to take four people, the whole community would have heard the gospel. If we would just take four. But we recognize that in this hour, less than 2% of Christians are involved in the ministry of evangelism. And we feel like God has called us off the field to encourage the body to, figure, to see what we have found in Jesus and to make him known everywhere we go. But God doesn't just send us, he equips us. And he's equipped you. He hasn't just sent you, but he's also equipped you with the ability to transform your city. Do we believe that? Do we? He has. John 14. Philip looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, show us the Father, and, and then we'll know. And he says, Philip, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he goes on to explain, he says, see, I am in the Father. And the Father is in me. But he doesn't just stop there. He says, guess what? And I am in you. That he has filled you with himself to not only transform you, but to transform the world around you. And I believe that he's looking to transform this city in this place. He's doing something unique in Florida. We're seeing it take place all across Florida, especially in Orlando. Things are happening. I feel like everybody I talk to these days is moving there. <laughs> but as, you know, Pastor, you, you've invited us to come to this, the, the, the conference of compassion. And I began to look at that word, compassion. And actually, when it's broken down into the, its Latin form, the word is pati. Pati, which directly translates to suffering. And it has a prefix attached to that com, com pati, which means with suffering. So I want to just take that word for a moment and then apply that to the word that we've seen countless times spoken over and over. He went with compassion 
It wasn't just a sympathetic feeling that he saw and sympathized with the people around him, but actually moves into empathy, a suffering for the people that surrounded him, that he saw it and began to attach his heart to it. Can we imagine if each one of us began to walk around and move in compassion? We've taken this word and we've, we've done it, dumbed it down to something so minute in comparison to its original form. Compassion. Can we imagine if we began to live every single day of our lives with compassion? And you see it laid out. We see what that looks like in the word. And I, this for me is, is a challenge every single time I pick this up and I read it. What I begin to see is believers who believed in something that transformed the world around them. And it challenges me because the same thing that's available to them was available to us right here and right now. The same thing. And 12 men turned the world upside down as a result. John 20, 21 says, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I now send you. He said this as he's looking at Philip with holes in his hand and holes in his side. He says, as the Father sent me, I now send you. And I began to think about that moment of thinking about Jesus walking the earth, how he had thousands following him. Actually, scripturally speaking, it says that when, when he stepped off the boat, that the people recognized him as Jesus. Many people stepped off the boat during that moment. But when he stepped off the boat, they recognized that's something that I don't see on everybody else. And that's the one who's living on the inside of us. That's the one that thousands of people began to follow from city to city, going off to over, over, overseas and walking into this place where they're, they're hungry. And that's why Jesus had to feed them because they were just walking and following this guy everywhere he went. Not even caring about themselves or taking care of themselves, their wives or their children. But that guy, i got to follow this guy. He's got something that I need. It's something I'm created for. Something I need right here, right now, and I'll follow him to the ends to do it. And even when Jesus looked at his disciples and says, hey, but guess what? You might not have a place to lay. Still, they followed him. Women with, a, with an issue of blood pushing through the people just to get to Jesus. Because he had something they needed. People ripping open ceilings just to lay their friends down because that's what you need right now. And he's saying, as the Father sent me, I now send you. Think about that. And if we capture that, it won't just transform us. It would transform everything. He says, be my witness. In Acts 1.8, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. As far as the land goes, that's how far you're going to go. Be my witness, as if to say, as if they, when they meet you, they're as if they're meeting my, me, myself. Be my witness. What would happen to Pinellas County if we began to be the witness of that? It's not just about preaching. It's not just about prophesying. We know that in Matthew 7, he says, look, many will come to me in that day. But if you're going to do that, you first got to do one thing, know me. Because we can't be his witness if we don't know him for ourselves. I want to tell you, that was me in the beginning of my ministry. I was trying to be his, be, be, I was going out and I was ministering. I was doing great things for the gospel, bringing it places where, and, and, and that it hadn't been. And I had to stop as a team and we say, man, we need to stop for a moment because we could bring a gospel into a village. And this becomes only Javin's idea of the gospel. And begin to start a church in this way, and a religion in this way, of Javin's comprehension of something that he thought he figured out. But if we haven't found him for ourselves, and I am convinced of one thing for sure, 
that if we weren't so, if our focus was singular, if it wasn't just about ministering out there, now I'm an evangelist and I go and I knock on doors all the time. I witness to someone every single day of my life. But my focus is not on witnessing. I believe if we had one focus, and it wasn't just on witnessing, it wasn't just on preaching, it wasn't just on getting people saved, but if it was singularly focused, I need to know that, that I promise you all of that would come as a byproduct. Because when we discover him, when you see him for yourself, it changes everything. And it brings you to places that your feet would never travel. It's real. It's real. And the world saw it in them, and it transformed cities. It was in Acts eleven twenty six where the disciples were first called Christians. They didn't call themselves Christians. They were called it because they saw their actions, they saw their lives, and they were being that witness. They said, that must be a Christ person. Because I saw what it looked like when Jesus came into my city. I know what that looked like. I know how the crowds followed him. I saw the reaction of when he looked into my eyes. That must be someone that had walked with Jesus. That's a Christ person. What would happen if we became Christ people, it would transform our city is what it would do if we captured the truth and the gravity of what this means. Actually, they tried to shut up the, the disciples at one point, and they said, look, you go out and you preach in this name, we're going to put you in prison, we're going to do you this, we're going to do that to you. And they were like, wow, what is it about these people? They, they, they're not schooled. And says this, it says, we've given them strict orders not to teach in the name, in this name. This is Acts 5.28. If you want to, go there because it's awesome to look at. It. We've given you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with its teaching. <laughs> Jerusalem, all of Jerusalem has been filled with its teaching. Because the byproduct of finding him is transforming your city. He wants to flip our cities upside down. It actually says in the scripture, it says that they were unschooled, but they can tell that they had been with Jesus. And I don't think it was just that they had been with Jesus, but they were currently walking filled with him. And what they were recognizing was that, that Holy Spirit that he said he was going to send. And you see it over and over in Acts, Acts 16. It says, when they had brought them to this chief, chief magistrate, they said, these men are throwing our city into an uproar. Now it's Acts 16, saying it again. More men of God, more Christ men walking into cities, and the cities being turned upside down. Acts 19.29 says, soon the whole city again was in uproar. Acts 19.10, it actually says, all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Why? Because they had discovered something that I am longing for. And that I wouldn't just die for, but I plan to live every day of my life for. That I will give every breath for. And I believe that we're going to see our city turned upside down. We're already seeing it. We're about to gather close to 10,000 believers from across our city to come together and cry out for more of the Lord. 10,000 believers in our small county. And I believe that there's city flippers here in this room. Because I'll tell you what happens. As we begin to surrender to that, he transforms our life. And he opens up opportunities for you on the streets. 
I can tell you while we were walking one day down on, on the streets, and you guys can get, just begin to play. Let me get a second. But as we were beginning to walk down the streets, we were knocking on doors. And so what we do is we, knock, we actually uh, we go to different churches across our community, all different denominations. And as we, we minister there on a Sunday, we encourage the body to come out that evening. We do a, a training of what it looks like to be out there on the streets. And then that following Saturday, we take them out onto the streets. And I tell them, get ready, because when we make ourselves available, God uses you. And we were walking down the streets, and as we were walking, a guy is driving by on a motorcycle, and his chain falls off. And he comes, parks probably about 30 feet away from us. And they go, I look at that, and I said, you guys, you know what that is? And they said, what? I said, that's an opportunity. I said, God opened up an opportunity. I said, this guy is going to get saved. And they just thought this was just chance, that we could have just kept walking, but I have learned to recognize the doors that God begins to open up. We begin to walk, talk to this guy. Turns out he had just come back from a, tr a trip up north where he met his father for the very first time in 25 years. And while he was there, his father lied to him and robbed him and kicked him out of the house. And so he's sitting there telling us a story to complete strangers, breaking down crying. And I got to explain to him that you might have an earthly father who has rejected you. But we have a heavenly father that would come to earth to die for us. This guy receives Christ right there on the spot. Opportunities begin to open up when we make ourselves available. We begin to be recognized in our community that every single time we go to a different restaurant, we're praying for the waitresses, we're praying for the staff, and now we're beginning to be recognized in our community as the ones who pray. And the other day, you know, we went into, a, went into the, the, the restaurant where we frequent quite, quite often. And they go, that's the guy. That's the guy. He's going to pray. He's going to pray. You should ask him. Just ask him. I'm hearing the staff in the background. And so I sit there. And they come. They serve us. And I didn't ask. And I waited to the very end. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to ask you. And they go, I know. And she's like, hold on. She walks to the back, goes and gets her friend, comes out. They're all wearing masks. And in this moment, the guy begins to open up his heart and begins to pull down his mask and cry out to us. And even though that was just an external movement of him pulling down that mask, I believe it was something that was taking place in his heart as well. But he's going to begin to move in your life when we just simply surrender. And I'm going to ask that we all just stand for a moment. I believe that God has given Joe a, 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 an incredible word that he's going to add to this message tonight. But I believe that there's a surrender that each and every one of us has to, that I can't say for you, pastor can't give for you, but it comes from each and every one of us individually. And it's a simple cry out of saying, God, would you use me? And we already know the answer to that. Is he wants to use us. He desires to use us. At the end of the day, it comes us down to us simply surrendering our voice to the Father. See, Cornelius found himself in this place asking God, would you move in my life? And, and, and an angel comes down and begins to talk to Cornelius and says, go and find Peter who's in Yopa in the other city. And he goes and finds, he sends his, his, his servants to go and find Peter. Peter then comes to the city. He goes and starts talking to Cornelius. And God moves radically in his life. The Holy Spirit falls. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. And I began to read that, that story in Acts 10. And I began to be shocked because an angel came down and spoke to Cornelius. Couldn't the angel himself be the one to, to deliver the Holy Spirit in that moment? But I began to realize something. That every single time God wants to do something extraordinary, he uses individuals who are willing. And so he said, now, I, yeah, the Holy Spirit could have came with the angel, but go and find my servant Peter. When you find him, he's going to bring the word of the Lord to you. And I believe that there are individuals here in this word, servant in this room, servants of the Lord, saying, God, will you use me? And I believe people are going to begin to seek you out. And so I just simply want to do this. As we sing one song, I want to ask you guys to just, in your own words, surrender yourself to the Father. Surrender your voice to the Father. Surrender your works, your thoughts, your words to the Father. So worship.
worship your majesty. I worship your the Holy Spirit. He can do more in five minutes than someone preaching for an hour. Touch us right now, God. Touch us right now. Holy Spirit. stand. If you want to come to the altar, you can do whatever you want to do. But I just want to tell you something, that God is about to do something. Because the kingdom of God is not in word, but it's in power. We could have the fanciest speeches, we could have the greatest intellect, we could have the, we could study all day, we can study words and we can look up languages, and that's all good to give us deeper revelation, but without power, it is nothing. We've watered down the gospel to techniques, to methods, and God can give us all of that. He can give us great phrases, great icebreakers. He can do all of this. But Paul said, I don't come with enticing words, but with power and demonstration. Too many people are talking about the kingdom instead of releasing the kingdom. Many people are looking to the left, looking to the right, saying, is the kingdom of God over there? Is the kingdom of God over here? But I'm here to tell you today that the kingdom of God is inside of you and he wants to come out in a greater measure. He is ready to re release everything. He's ready to immerse nations. He's ready to use individuals in this house to change cities. But so many people are worried about what's going on. Oh my gosh, what season we are in? Is it the hour? So many people want to be wise. We have to know the seasons. <laughs> Is it the end? What's going on? Should I have kids? <sighs> <sighs> Wearing me out just thinking about it. I get worn out thinking about that. Acts 1-7. <laughs> and he said to them, 
It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, to the end of the earth. I know a lot of people are talking about, hey, it's special right now. There's a door, there's an open window, there's this, there's that. But I'm here to tell you something. The most special thing that ever happened was 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ died on the cross. It's always been the end. Why? Because your life is short. It's like a vapor. But what are you going to do with your life? Are you going to make it count? Are you going to live for eternity? Or are you going to be worried about what season it is? What the real estate market's going to do? What my job security is? Are you going to worry about these seasons? Or are you going to come to the house of the Lord to receive power? Are you going to wake up on Monday to receive power? Are you going to wake up on Tuesday to receive power? Let me tell you something. Whew. Sometimes when we think doors are closed, God's just willing to see how far we'll go. Because, yeah, America's been spoiled. But there's people that have been facing persecutions for thousands of years. Thousands of years. Suffering violence. Whew. Just like in the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God suffers violence. But I'm here to tell you this. The violent take it by force. You say, man, hey, this guy Joe, he's pretty crazy. He even sounds, he might sound a little angry. He might be like, whoa, he might be shouting too much. But let me tell you something. There's a violent fire inside of me that wants to attack the darkness. Some people are made different. Me, I am wired a little bit different. I want to go to those crazy places. I want to go where it's dark. I want to go where they're saying, hey, you can't preach Jesus here. And I want to walk up in that city and say, here I am. The Lord sent me. Come on, you want to know, learn how to take a city? Read your Bible. God can give us strategies. He can give us wisdom from above. He can do all these things, and these things are good. But how many know that the word of God is the best thing to follow. Matthew 9, verse 35, 36 through 38. Jesus went through all towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. You want to know how to take a city? You go up in that city. You release the kingdom of God. You heal the sick. You set the captive free. Oh, a lot of people aren't going to like this, especially all the theologians out there. Let me tell you something about the gospel. Some people are coming up with their methods, and they're saying you got to preach the whole gospel. They're saying if you just go around and pray for the sick, and you walk away, what did you do for them? <laughs> they want to go through the Romans road. It's not bad. You can use it. It's great. Whew. They want to come against the gifts of the Spirit. They want to quench the Spirit. But let me tell you about my Bible and what the Bible says. My Jesus went to ten lepers. He healed them all. You didn't, say, you didn't see him sit there and say, hey, I just want to let you guys know that the gospel is I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again, I'm going to do this. He just healed them. He released the kingdom. And he waited to see who was going to come back. Where you read out throughout this Bible, 
wherever the gospel is preached, wherever the kingdom is released, people are getting healed. People are getting set free. Now, did they all get saved? No. Is everybody going to get saved? I hope so. But narrow is the road. Wide is the road to destruction. But let's not forget the power. Let's not get so caught up in our minds of what's right and what's wrong. Peter didn't feel that way in Cornelius' house. He's just talking and the spirit falls. I've been in meetings where the spirit just, just comes and just people just get wrecked. I've seen multitudes come to Jesus over the past four months. I've seen over 5,000 people give their life to Jesus. And we have, hey, listen, we have to be careful because there's people that are a little self-righteous sometimes and they're like, oh, we need to go after the one. And I agree with that. But Jesus had 99 to begin with. When the gospel was first preached, what happened? 3,000 people got saved. You say, Joe, do you care about numbers? Yes, I care about numbers. I care about every soul in every city. I want to see them all get saved. I want to see them all get set free. Just like Javin, man, God's given him wisdom. Get 10,000 believers together. Whew. People are going to come. Not just the saved, but the lost. Because they want to see the kingdom of God. Because there's something different. Now is the time. But it starts with compassion. He said he had compassion on them. That word compassion means a yearning inside of your soul that hurts. We don't go into a city and blow it up and have a big crusade because we just want to take awesome pictures and say, hey, look what we did. We want to go into cities we want to go out in the fields. We want to visit people. We want to visit the persecuted Christians where you see a seven-year-old boy who's forced in labor, enslaved, and he's making bricks with his hands day after day. But the most beautiful thing is the, guy just, the kid just had a smile on his face because he had Jesus. And sometimes, you know, we hear all these stats about how bad things are getting and how dark things, man. But I want to tell you guys, I got good news. I got really good news. The kingdom of God is always advancing. We're not defeated. We're not going down. Darkness is not going to take over. I'm here to tell you that we have victory in Christ. I'm here to tell you that even in the Middle East, man, in Pakistan, it used to be 3% Christian. It's getting about to 8 to 10%. There's Christians now in the government. People are pushing back. People are fighting. And it's, us, it's up to us to go to these nations and to encourage them, to strengthen them. And let me tell you something. When you go over there, God does a work in your heart. Because when you walk into an area that's completely constricted, that comes, that constrains you. When you walk off, and you walk into the land, and you feel like tr something's trying to trap you, all of a sudden you feel the Spirit of God starting to stir up inside of you, saying, what is this? Because the Holy Spirit does not want to be contained. And then all of a sudden, just keep stirring and stir it and then when you go to release it so much power comes out and you see so many miracles and you see so much glory when we were uh, on the crusade stage and I love crusades because I feel like Jesus when he walked into the city everybody came everybody got healed Everybody got saved. All of Jerusalem was filled. But we came there, and there was this man, and he was probably about 30 years old. 
And he comes up to the crusade stage, and I'm looking over, and we're doing testimonies at the time. And the guy looks at me and said, he said, this guy got healed, right? This guy got healed. He could never speak in his life, and now he can speak. I'm like, awesome, get him up here. <laughs> and he gets up on the stage, and I look at the security guard, and I said, all right, bring him over here. And he goes, no, 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 you need to pray for him. I'm like, what? No, no, he needs to be healed. what happens when you can't speak the language <laughs> and I'm sitting there like I'm new to this <laughs> I'm a novice you know and so I start to pray for the man and I said in the name of Jesus I command you to speak and then he just looks at me and he goes no <laughs> he didn't say no he just and then I realized he couldn't hear he couldn't speak couldn't do anything and then I heard God say working of miracles because miracles you have to work out sometimes because sometimes people just want to get the easy touch and the easy heal and they want to sit in their chair and they don't want to do anything and they just want to be like God please I wish that you would hope that you would heal me but sometimes we have to take a step of faith and I believe that there's many people in here tonight that are going to take that step of faith and things are going to get worked out and so I just looked at the man, I said, in the name of Jesus, you're going to say amen. He said, amen. I'm shocked. Translator shocked. And I said, say hallelujah. He says, hallelujah. Then next thing you know, people flood the stage and all of a sudden, boom, miracles. Bam, 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 bam. Healings, bam, bam, bam. Muslims getting saved left and right. Because let me tell you something, anybody you can talk something, somebody into, someone else can come along and talk them out of. But when you experience the presence, the power, and the kingdom in your life, nothing can change you. I'm here to tell you tonight that one touch can change your life. Sometimes we're waiting. Sometimes we, you know, we come to these things and we're like, man, I really hope someone can give me a word from the Lord. But what about a touch? What about the fire of God that can cleanse you? And you might be thinking, oh, I already got the fire of God. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was eight years old and I spoke in tongues. I checked the box. I got it. Let me tell you something. The baptism of the Holy Spirit isn't a one-time act. Because in Acts chapter 2, when they got filled with the Holy Ghost, they went out and they preached the gospel. They saw signs and wonders and multitudes came to Christ and persecution came against them. But they didn't go. You fast forward to Acts chapter 4. What they do, they went back up into the upper room to pray for more boldness and they got filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're here tonight and you think you got the Spirit, you need to check yourself. Because I need to be filled every day. I need to come to worship. I need to be at the altar. Because if I don't spend time with God within two days and I don't get filled, I'm falling apart. I'm nasty to my wife. I'm nasty to my kids. I don't really care. I'm going out preaching the gospel out of selfish ambition for myself, for ministry. Just so people think I'm doing something. I haven't lost it. My own ego. Let me tell you something. The, oh, let me tell you. The great commission without compassion is the great ambition. We're not here just to come up with awesome stories and awesome testimonies. We're here to change lives. We're here to turn cities upside down. What, but what's it through? Through the power of the gospel. You might not know what to say. When I was with Dom, the first six months in the streets, had no idea what to say. But we saw the raw power of Christ. You can take classes, you can get techniques, you can go to trainings. But let me tell you something, when you get filled with the Holy Ghost and boldness, you just got to let out and let it roar. The righteous are bold like lions. And it's a gift. Sometimes we feel like we have to come to church all holy or fast for two weeks. <laughs> Read our Bibles, man, I'm really going to get it now. I'm really going to get filled now. 
the baptism of the the filling of the Holy Spirit is not a reward, it's a gift. When you run a race and you finish, you get a reward, you get a prize. But you don't need power at the end of the race. You need power at the beginning of the race. That's why God gives it to you as a gift. But so many people want to be self-righteous. They want to be like the parable that Jesus talks about with the two servants, where the one guy, he's reading his Bible, he's fasting, he's in the synagogue. He's like, Lord, look at me, I'm doing really good. And then this drunk guy comes walking in off the streets, and he comes to the altar, and he said, have mercy on me, God. Have mercy on me, Lord. Mercy. Mercy. We all fall short of the glory of God. No, there is not one righteous. And you might come here tonight thinking, man, I did something really bad today, or it's been bad all week, but I'm here to tell you God wants to touch you. God wants to fill you. God wants to set you free. God wants to heal you. Why? Because not because of you and what you've done, but because of how merciful he is. It's time that we stop playing church. It's time that we start being the church. You can uh, build community. You can build family. And I understand what you're saying. I really do. But after Jesus was done healing the sick and he was teaching, and he was sitting down with his disciples, his mom and his brother came knocking at the door. Knock, knock, knock. And they said, Jesus, your mom's here. Your brother's here. Who is my mom? Who is my brother? My family is anyone who does the will of the Father. You're so busy, worried about your family and what they're doing that you're not running after the kingdom. My Bible says, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he'll add everything unto you, including your family including your son, including your daughter, including your grandparents. It says in the book of Acts, when you're saved, your whole house will, will be saved. Start banking on the promises and don't be getting caught up in manipulation and saying, I can't come to church, I can't come to outreach, I'm too busy doing all this stuff. Because also in the last days, he's going to pour out his spirit, but it also says in the last days that it was like the days of Noah. They were marrying, they were drinking, they were having a good time. They were watching Netflix. They were playing putt-putt golf. They were spending their stimulus checks. They were getting, you know, fresh J's. Rebuking myself right now. Yeah. That's real. There's something greater. I'm here to tell you tonight that none of the ministers up here are special. No one. God honors the least of these, and man, I was the lowest of the lows. Lowest of the lows. Eight years ago, IV drug user, depressed, angry, rage against the world. My mom can testify, she's right here. Raised hell. But when I walked into the house of God, and I cried out for mercy, mercy, Lord. I got touched by the Holy Spirit. I got filled with the Holy Ghost. I felt power run through my body. I started shaking. I saw the demons fly off of me. I saw angels killing the demons around me. You say, Joe, man, I've never been oppressed or, or possessed by a demon. Let me tell you something. If you don't get angry and you go straight to rage, there might be a demon around your life. If you turn on a song and you go into complete depression and you don't eat for a day, there might be a demon in your life. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus has come to set the captive free tonight. I'm here to tell you that the power of the gospel is here tonight. I'm telling you that the fresh fire of God is here tonight to fill you with the Holy Ghost and he's going to touch you in a way that you've never been touched. You're going to feel electricity on your body. You might fall down. You might fall back. You might start shaking. Something crazy might start happening, but you got to yield to the Holy Ghost. What's happening inside of you right now and you're feeling it and your heart's, you got to yield to it. You can't come in here and be like, man, I got it, because I don't have it. I need it. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Are you hungry tonight, church? Can we get the rest of the band up here right now? Close your eyes for a second. Yeah, we might get out of order, but we might get in his order. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Stand to your feet real quick. And I just want you guys, if you can pray, if you can pray in the Holy Ghost, just start praying in the Holy Ghost right now. Jesus wants to touch this place tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Press in, saints, real quick, just for 30 seconds. Press in. I'm here to tell you tonight, if you want a fresh touch from God, if you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, if you want to be filled with boldness, if you want breakthrough in your life, if you want healing, I want you to run down to this altar right now in the name of Jesus, because God is about to touch you in this place. I'm going to have Pastor Dom and Javin come up here also. Hey, Jesus about to touch this place right now. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Don't be looking around. Look up. Look up at Jesus. Look up at Jesus. Don't be looking around. Look up at Jesus. Look up at Jesus. Like a rushing mighty wind, God, right now. Fresh fire in this place right now, God. Fresh fire in this place right now, Jesus.
Jesus. Keep drinking, keep drinking. Keep drinking, keep drinking. It's a gift. It's a gift. <laughs> keep drinking. Oh, there's still more. There's still more. There's still more. Oh, don't be satisfied. Oh, don't be satisfied. Oh, Jesus. Can I have my wife up here, Krista? Krista, can you come up here? If you need a healing in your body right now, this is what we're going to do. The power of God is going to touch you. People can lay hands on you, but let me tell you something. God can touch you right where you're at. My wife, she was in Africa, and a man came up to him, and he couldn't speak. And she prayed, and the guy began to speak. We were actually in South Africa one time. We were in a hospital, and the guy came in, and the guy who's been blind for two weeks and couldn't see, and he's running to the hospital. And she goes, why are you coming to the hospital? I'm blind, I'm blind. She goes, let me pray for you. As soon as she prayed, his eyes opened. And then she says, are you still going to go to the hospital? He's like, why would I? I can see now. If you need a healing in this place right now, I just, wherever the healing you need in your body, how many people need a healing? Just wave your hand real quick. Just wave your hand real quick. I want you to put your hand right where you need the healing. And I'm going to have my wife pray, and there's going to be a releasing of the healing power of God in this place. And the pain is going to leave instantly, instantly, instantly. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, Jesus. If that's you, if you have an area of pain on your body right now, raise your hand. If it's down, put it up in the air. Anybody who sees, you know, we've done this before, but God will do it again. If you're around somebody, ask them where the pain is and put your hand where the pain is. If, if it's a guy, go with a guy. Make sure your hand, and if it's you, just believe right now. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. God, your word says that when two or more come together and ask for something in your name, it shall be done. So God, we just thank you. We thank you that you are our healer, God. We just speak right now to every backache and we say, go in Jesus' name, go, go. Every kidney issue, uh, I don't know if it's a stone or just a flank pain somewhere in your kidneys right now. We just release all pressure, all, um, all blockage, any pain, go right now in Jesus' name. Migraines, go. Night terrors, go in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you for your healing touch in this place right now. We thank you for for the promises of your word, God. We just speak to every single need, every cancer cell be broken in Jesus' name. Every heart condition, blood pressure, regulate in Jesus' name, Lord. We pray that the next time we go to the doctors, the readings will be normal, God, that we can throw out the medication in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Now say out loud, thank you, Jesus, for my healing and praise him. And lift your hands and shout with a voice of triumph, with the victory, Lord. We thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Right now, I want you to test. I want you to test. If you had physical pain, I want you to test it right now. I want you to work it out right now. Do something that you couldn't do right now. Do something that you couldn't do right now. Believe God by faith right now. Just do something that you couldn't do. Jesus. If you feel like God has healed you, and I don't want to just wave hand, I don't, I don't need emotions, I don't need any of that. I just want you to just wave your hand if you feel like God has healed you and you can't do, you can do something that you can't do before. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. Want to pray? What? She? How, do, how are you feeling right now? What's happening? Feels better? What was going on? Come on up here. I want you to share real quick. I want you to share real quick. I'm 
So what was going on when you came in here? What kind of pain or what were you feeling? It's okay, guys. <laughs> UTIs. Um, I've suffered from kidney stones a few times here and there. And um, last Saturday, or this past Saturday, I, I left work and I had to go straight to um, <laughs> I had to go straight to a walk-in because I started having severe pain. Um, I had blood clots, things like that. It was really uncomfortable. Um, they put me on an antibiotic and it wasn't seeming to work and this morning I was telling Nate, you know, I think it's getting worse. I need to, um, I need to make another doctor's appointment. Um, and then sitting in service today, I had to go to the bathroom. I came back, told him, you know, it, it's my back starting to hurt um, really bad again. And <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I'm going to do it like we do in Africa. Who healed you? Oh, praise God. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Real quick, I, I believe that tonight, not because of who, are, who we are, but just our calling is just me and Javin. And it has nothing to do with us. It's just what God has called us to do, that there's a gifting, there's a, a releasing tonight. And I just want all the evangelists that are in the house. And what I mean by evangelists, people might think like you're like this preacher like Benny Hinn and, or Reinhard Bunky or anything. But an evangelist is a traveling missionary. Someone called to preach the gospel to the nations. That is an evangelist. There's not big evangelists and little evangelists. There are evangelists in this house tonight. And God has called you for a long time. And there's breakthrough, and God is going to give you boldness, wisdom, and strategy right here, right now. So if that's you tonight, what I want you to do is I want you to come stand up on this front row. Awesome. If that's you tonight, if you feel called to preach the gospel to nations, unreached people groups, mass crusades, to, to the cities of America. If that's you tonight, I'm calling you to the front because guess what? The time is now. Now is the time. Evangelists don't wait for opportunity. They create opportunity. And now is the time. Jesus. So I'm going to have either, I'm going to have also Joe Navarre. He's an evangelist. He's going to lay hands. Javin, I want you to come up here and we're going to lay hands on you and God's going to release the gifting and calling in your life right now.
But the most beautiful thing is he wants to make you amazing. The time is now. There's people here that are waiting for permission. And I'm here to tell you that God's given it to you. There's areas around here, people that have even been going to this church. You might be thinking that Saturday night, Saturday during the day, it might conflict with you. And God might begin giving you a specific area on your heart. What you need to do is you need to come to Pastor Dom and just share it with him. And I'm telling you right now, this man will let you run with it. He'll support you. He'll help you grow. He did the same thing with me. I started off in the streets of Newport Ritchie. And I told him I wanted to do it Friday nights. And he gave me wisdom. He taught me. He strengthened me. This man is a discipler. But you have to be the one to step up. If you think he, you know, he, he has so much going on and he loves you, but you know what God's calling you to do. It's time to work together. It's time to step out. It's time to break free. It's your time. You are the one for this hour in your neighborhood, in your community, in your workplace. God is putting specific ministries on people's hearts right now for the elderly for the homeless, for different people. And this man, he'll hear your heart and he'll help you and he'll make you more fruitful than you could ever dream. I promise you that. I love you, man. <laughs> now he's gonna, he's gonna call me next week and be like, Joe, I got 20 phone calls. <laughs> Just kidding. Can we, I always want us to understand that, you know, some people may have walked in here and you may, you may be visiting with us and you're like, wow, like, I've been to church, but I don't know what the heck this is or, you know, whatever. I, I want you to know that we love the presence of God so much. And as you heard so wonderfully said, can we just... Can we just once again thank Minister Javin and Evangelist Joe tonight for just. <laughs> One thing I want you all to do in this room right now is I want you to say this out loud three times. I'll never be the same again. Now, the reason I need you to sh shout that out three times is because the enemy is going to lie to you when you leave this place. The enemy is going to say, yeah, I fell on the floor, but it was all motion, or somebody prayed for me, it was all motion. The enemy is so crafty. He tries to come in immediately after God does a work. So what you're going to do what did we say earlier? That when your problems, when you hit work tomorrow and somebody gives you a rough attitude, you know what I'm saying? It's a flesh checker. <laughs> See what areas of your life aren't surrendered, but what you're going to do is you're going to remember that I'm never going to be the same again. And you know what? Every day from on, you don't need a preacher, you don't need a worship team because you have the Holy Spirit. He's the greatest worship leader. He's the greatest teacher. He will reveal Jesus to you every day. I, I'm completely convinced that there is nothing more exhilarating than the daily rediscovery of Jesus. Wake up tomorrow morning and say, thank you, God. Thank you.
thank you, God. It's the most prideful thing you can do to think you can start your day without the one who made it. It's the most prideful thing you could do is start a day without the one who made it. It's like robbing a hero of his story. It's his story. So right now, I want us all to yell, okay? I'll never be the same again three times. I know it's a lot of words. We'll find a way to do it. One, two, three. I'll never be the same again. I'll never be the same again. I'll never be the same again. Now praise the Lord. This is your night. Jesus. Somebody's got to celebrate. You're never going to be the same again. Never. Never. In fact, if we find you being the same again, I'll remind you. Don't be the same. Never the same. What I want to do at this moment is I want my wife to close us out in prayer. But can we do, can we do something with this all being unity? Can you grab the hand of a neighbor and let's just close in prayer? But I really believe something's about to shift in this prayer at the end. Everybody be here tomorrow night. You are going to want to be here. You are not going to want to watch it live. You're not going to want to watch a re. Say, I'm going to be here tomorrow night. That wasn't good enough. I need you to make sure that you, you know, I, I'm going to be here tomorrow night. So if you're not here tomorrow, that means you're being the same. You got to be never the same again. That means no more lying, okay? So you got to be here tomorrow. All right, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for tonight. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the mighty work that you have done within us. We thank you that any part within us that is uncomfortable, Father, we thank you that it goes in the name of Jesus, that anything that would just irritate us or anything, Father, I thank you that whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So I thank you. I thank you that we will never be the same going forward. Forward. Oh, we worship you. We thank you that Thanksgiving will continually come out of our mouth. We thank you that we are going to know greater tomorrow than we did today what it is to be praying without ceasing. We thank you that you are with us, that you have never left us, that you go before us. We thank you that we would have your word so before us, so within our hearts, that it just comes overflowing. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you that you are filling us to overflowing, that we would purpose to fill ourselves with all of you so that there would be nothing less of us. And we thank you that it's all for your glory. We thank you that people would know and come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior just by being around us, Father, because you are the light and the light breaks out all of the darkness. Anything that is of comfort, it's it goes in the name of Jesus. So we thank you. We thank you that you are protecting our families, our friends, Father. Oh, we worship you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Oh, you are so beautiful. You are so good. You are so worthy. You are so holy. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you that our bodies would just be overcome with your joy in every single situation that we can choose joy because we choose you above everything, Father. We thank you. We worship you. We honor you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Oh, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. It follows us all the days of our lives. I thank you that we slow down to receive it, that we receive all of the blessings that you have for us. Oh, we receive your gifts. We receive them. We thank you. And it's not just, it's not to promote ourselves or anything. It's just for your love to be lavished upon us, that we would know deeper today than we did yesterday how much you love us. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you that it's the empowerment to help us move each and every step of the day that we have. We thank you that it's an empowerment. Oh, we worship you, we love you, we thank you. We thank you, we thank you. We leave encouraged and filled with joy. Oh, we thank you. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.
Hold on. Hold on, everybody, right before you go. This has to be a word. <laughs> this has to be a word, because Jesse doesn't ever do this. Everybody's got to listen to this. And then I have one thing I want to challenge you. Um, okay, I'll do this without crying. Come on, Lord. So, standing over here, I started to feel a burn in my heart. And I've been really thinking about Peter, and we all love Peter, and I was thinking about the story where he messed up big time, right? He denied Christ those three times, and the rooster crowed as soon as he denied him that third time. And the way that humans are created, things trigger us, right? Sounds trigger us smells trigger us. We think of grandma when we smell a flower. We think, you know, things trigger us. And Satan knew that things trigger us. So he made that rooster crow. And what happens every morning, the rooster crow, well, obviously not now, but you know, back then, the rooster crowed every morning. And it would remind him every morning, every morning, I denied Christ three times. Oh my gosh, I denied him three times. He told me I was going to, I denied him. And he did it every morning. But then what happened? Peter went out onto the boat. He was fishing. He didn't catch anything, right? Someone from the shore said, throw it on the other side. He did it. I mean, he was like, it's seven feet. What am I going to do? Throws it on the other side. He catches fish. Um, immediately, he said, that's Jesus. He gets out of the boat, goes to the shore. Jesus already has breakfast made, right? And what does Jesus do? He asks Peter what question three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And it's in the morning that he asks him that. So obviously I'm thinking in my own head what probably happened after he said that three times. He probably heard a rooster crow. It doesn't say it in the Bible. He just, you know. But that's what I kept thinking when you said three times. Let's say this three times. So we're going to have to say that three times again so that we're all reminded again that we are never going to be the same again. <sighs> that's a rainbow word. That's a rhema word. I hear the Holy, you have, you have Holy Ghost triggers now. You don't have Satan triggers. That's the old man. Let's say it three times again. One, two, three. I'll never be the same again. I'll never be the same again. I'll never be the same again. Because Jesus, because of Jesus. Last thing. Can, how, can, can I challenge the body of Christ right now? Okay, what I want us to do, everybody in this room, on your way home tonight, I don't care if you need gas or not, you're stopping somewhere and sharing Jesus on your way home tonight. I'm, I'm telling you, uh, you're actually not going to be able to sleep okay. I'm going to say it right now. You go somewhere right now and you tell them about Jesus. We will fill this place up tomorrow. You go right now. Th this is what we talked about tonight, that it's on you. You got hands laid on you that go all over the place. So on your way home tonight, I don't. You, you're going to find somebody, divine appointments. If everybody in this room talks to somebody about Jesus on the way home, come on. This is what we need to do. The church is, the church is like, I'll wait till next time we meet. No, everybody, we are an army leaving this room right now. Go tell somebody about Jesus. We'll see you tomorrow, 7 o'clock, with Michael Dow. God bless y'all.